Hi, have a seat. Have a seat. Have a seat. Am I on? Have a seat. Here we go. Here we go. Hey, go to the front of the Bible and just hang out somewhere from Genesis to Psalms. Just hang out somewhere there and we'll get the reference here in just a moment. And I am excited about being here. Uh, this truly is my home away from home. Uh, in fact, I saw Miss Bell almost stepped on her foot. And uh, well, for all these years, I have called them mom and dad. And so it's just like, hey, mom, hey, dad. You, you know, because Ma Bell, get it? The, the, the phone company. Okay, so it always struck me funny. Last name's Bell. So, hey, hey, Ma Bell, how you doing? And uh, so last night, it was almost instinctive. I almost reached up and gave her a hug. And, and then I thought, no, you can't hug her. You know, you can't hug that woman. And, uh, but when she's old, when she's in her 90s, I'm going to hug her. Amen? And uh, so anyways, but, uh, and when, I think I just said I'm going to hug your wife. I did not mean that. I'm, I'm Okay. Hang out the front. That was wrong and bad Bob. And so anyways, but uh, I'm glad to be here. Uh, and Brother Hicks and Brother, Co Brother Jenkins, oh, you and I might as well fold it up and go to the house. They might as well just replay those two sermons for the next four times and we're done. So anyways, but, uh, but, but we're going to do our part and we're just going to get into it. Thank you for being here on a Wednesday morning. And this is Wednesday, right? Okay, Wednesday morning. And uh, so, and it's good to be with Brother Jenkins. And I'm going to try to be done, Brother Jenkins, in a timely manner. Now, Brother Cox uh, said that uh, 18 minutes, right? Was it 18 minutes? And he said, I won't be 18 minutes. And he was telling the truth. Yeah, but uh, and then he kept saying, I feel like I'm going too long. And it was like, it was like, we just were so, I'm telling you, man, God came down last night. Uh, so I told Brother Rob that if I get stuck, I'm going to be like them WWF wrestlers. I'm just going to go to the end of the turnbuckle and, and high five, do a backflip off, and he'll get in the ring and, and take it from there. So, uh, but anyway, go to the very front of the Bible. And are you hanging out there? And uh, I will tell you this, I, I am, am being totally honest about this one right here. Are you ready? This was not the sermon I had in my repertoire for Wednesday morning. And uh, this was not it. Uh, in fact, even right now, I'm looking at it, looking at y'all going, oh, no, this is just one of those. But I will tell you right now, for, for a preacher not to follow the leading of the Holy Ghost of God is a disservice to my master. And, uh, and so it's a sermon I preached on Sunday night at our place. Uh, and uh, so this is like so fresh uh, that it still smells a little bit from the bakery. Uh, so I'm just going to go out there and step out, and I have no idea, y'all. You know, there's a lot of passages that when you say it, everybody's right there with you. John 3.16 is love. You know, it's a verse in the Bible. John 3.16 <laughs> it, it is about what? Love. When you say, take your Bibles, turn to Ephesians 5, uh, you, you know you're going to talk about what? Marriage, husband and wife. When you say take your Bibles, turn to Malachi chapter 3. Mm. You, you know what I mean? There are just certain passages that, you know, when you go to say take your Bibles, turn to Romans chapter 10, verse 13, you know, okay, it's going to be about soul winning. Are you hanging out the front of the Bible? Are you ready? Are you ready? I'm going to duck just a little bit. Would it be okay? Are you ready? Deuteronomy 22, 5. Okay. Now I have no idea. And I'm not even saying that there's a problem. I'm just saying that uh, Deuteronomy 22.5. When is the last time you have heard an entire sermon dedicated to Deuteronomy 22.5? And it is sad. It, it is sad because it's such a foundational principle uh, that I'm, a, I'm afraid uh, that the average independent Baptist church, for the sake of wanting to be liked, never preaches on it. Thus, our ladies in our church are suffering, and our men don't even know how to approach it with their wives. And I truly believe this, the, the husband in the home should set, set the tone for the dress, not the pastor from the pulpit. Amen. Because I think the husband is the head of the home. Amen. And I think the chain of command has been so disrespected, but I'll tell you why. It's because the preachers in America really don't know how to biblically exegete this scripture, and they don't know how, how do I do this? How do I do this without making people upset? And you listen to me, there's two people you never want to argue with, God and mamas. 
Um, so, so once the ladies get upset in your life, it's like, oh, my son's fixing to get married in October. Uh, and, uh, and he, he's, you know, right now he's got that, I'm the man of the house. He crossed his first hurdle the other day. He had, he had, you know, because she's in Georgia, he's in Texas, which is a blessing. <laughs> and uh, so uh, he's trying to set up this house. So he found this furniture, you know. And uh, well, a guy's attitude, what furniture is, and what a lady views his, the, y'all, they're two different, they're two different ends of the spectrum. It's not the same. Would y'all agree with that? Yeah. He's like, I found the deal. I found it. I called her and said, woman, this is what we're getting. <laughs> Silence on the other end. And then he was like, Grace, did you not like, she goes, mm. so he's telling me the story. And I said to him, come on, big boy. What were you like after that conversation? He said, dad, I felt led to move on and find something else. And, and so, so it is hard. I, ladies, I don't know if you know this or not, but you're very intimidating uh, to a man because we don't know how to interpret silence. We don't. We would much rather you scream at us, throw something at us, because we can duck. <laughs> and we can come right back at you. But we don't. Guys, am I telling the truth? Yeah. We don't know how to interpret silence. Does your silence mean that I don't get food tonight? Does your silence mean that I have to wash my own clothes? Does your silence mean you're going to pack up and leave me? Uh, and, and the worst thing could ever is after you have a fight with your wife is for her not to answer the phone. <laughs> then it's like, I know, I know that. Anyway, so... Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I, like I did Sunday night, God, I've asked you a hundred times, would you please let me change the sermon? And God, I don't understand it, but Lord, I'm just going to do it. And Lord, I ask for your heart, not my mind, not my heart, your heart. And God, may I, may I articulate it in such a way uh, that everybody walks out wanting to please you more because of this morning. God, I ask for your blessings. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I don't think I'm going to get above this tone. I don't think I'm going to get above uh, my demeanor of what it is right now. I, I do want to make some opening remarks, I think, to help you because everybody here has a mindset on this verse. Everybody here, if you've been in church for any length of time, you have heard sermons uh, that preachers have taken this verse and pulled it out, and it's been used. Uh, so... I, my goal, I guess, is to just be a sane, sensible voice for God. Um, I truly want ladies at the end of when we're done to walk out with a knowledge and to be led gently, softly. Uh, and that's how you lead ladies. You lead them gently and you lead them softly to come to a conclusion that you have to make. A conclusion that God has already made in his word. It's a conclusion that I, as a husband, have already made. But I'll tell you this, it's easy for me to make this conclusion because I don't think that it is hard for me to dress like a man and I don't think, and, and I don't, I've never been tempted to dress like a woman. Amen. 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 Page two. <laughs> the big conundrum, do you like that word? That's a good word. The big conundrum, y'all are like, what's a conundrum? It's a fruit that grows on a tree in East Texas. And uh, if you put pepper on it. The big conundrum, though, with preachers is this, and, and, I'm, and, and I don't know if you're sensing my struggle right now. The big conundrum is this. How do we teach a tough subject and on the seesaw have a balance of grace and truth? Yes. Because there is a balance. Yes. Because at the moment I am not graceful in this truth, the average lady will reach up and just turn it off. A lady does not mind the truth. I've never met a lady yet in 30 years of preaching that doesn't mind, I want the truth, I want honesty. A lady is tired of living in the shadows of deceit and dishonesty with the average man in, she, in her life that she just tell me straight. I, I've, I've had 15 kids, I've cleaned the house, I've changed diapers, I've I've, I've mopped up puke. I've done it all. So what you're about to tell me will not shock me, but do not demean me on the road to telling me the truth. And so I don't know of a lady yet that doesn't want the truth. You know what they don't want with it, though? They don't want the sarcastic remarks that come yeah. with the truth. Right. And they don't want somebody painting a picture that they're a terrible lady right. and telling the truth. And I think to some degree that... Uh, 
I, we were at camp, and, and y'all, this is his name. We were at camp uh, so about a month ago, and, the, and our morning preacher, his name is Pastor Rusty Hammer. Now, now that, that, no, 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 that is his name. That is his legal name. You ready for his middle name? Stanley. Oh, no. <laughs> Brother Jenkins, th that is the God's truth. Pastor Rusty Stanley Hammer. Y'all, our kids will not go to camp. If, they, if, if, if Rusty Hammer is not there, he's not going. In fact, I'm bringing him down this year to preach in College Chapel because he is like great. He made an opening statement that was incredible. Listen to this. He's talking about interaction with the world, and he said this, we are not called to be nice, we are called to be kind. That's a great statement. Because when you're trying to be nice, you're just trying to get along, and you will compromise on every level for the sake of the relationship. But we're called to be kind. And do you know, in giving truth, let me tell you something, I am to be kind in giving the truth, but I'm still supposed to give the truth. And on this one verse... If my disposition overshadows my position, then I've not shown Christ in what we're about to talk about. Ladies, the highest form of motivation is not conformity. It is love for the Lord. If you'll allow God's word, listen to this, to say what it says, mean what it means, and let the Holy Ghost apply it, and you embrace it, I promise you this is a whole new world for you to live in. Don't try to repackage Deuteronomy 22.5. Don't try to repaint Deuteronomy 22.5 to match the hue of your life. Change your life to match the hue of God's heart. You're special, ladies. Yes. You're valuable. Yes. You are to be revered. You are to be put on a pedestal. You are to be put in a china cabinet. And every husband has the same makeup when we first get married, and that is this, or they should have. I don't want my, my, my woman folk out in the world. I don't want them to go work. I want to protect them because I, I, I just don't want them to be that way. Now, when we first got married, I thought I'm going to work three and four jobs. And I'm going to have Kelly just stay inside this protective environment. My dad very quickly had to tell me, son, what do you expect her to do all day? She's going to get bored. Now, you, I know you don't want her to work, but son, she's going to get bored. And what was done in the early days of marriage out of keeping her from being bored, well, you know how it goes. You start having children and uh, costs start picking up. And then work became a necessity uh, just to get our kids through school and just to pay the bills. But it grieved me every time she had to walk out that door and go to work. And now that we have RG, as Brother Hunter uh, is very well aware of having a special needs uh, son, now that's her full-time job uh, and there's no way uh, that it could be any way different. But, but every, every husband is like, I, I just, I just want to keep him protected. I, wa I don't want anything to happen to them. And ladies, let me tell you something. That's how God made you. Now, now don't, don't take what I just said, that they are a weak race and gender. They're not. Let me tell you something. Don't fool with mamas. They carry carriers. Y'all, they got Popeye arms like that. And you don't know it at night, but at night they break out the pipe and eat the spinach, and the next day they are just like, I'm telling you, don't fool with women. But would you not agree with me, ladies, that, that if y'all have a late night, you ain't having an early morning? <laughs> you know, I used to hear old-time preachers say, bless God, my woman got up, at, at my mama got up at 5 o'clock every morning. You want to know why? Because she went to bed at 4. Right. <laughs> You know, when you don't got electricity and the sun goes down and you don't have any more candles, time to go to bed. Seven? Yeah, my wife used to tell me I need eight hours. I used to laugh at her in them early days. Woman, ain't nobody needs eight hours. Ain't nobody going to get eight hours in this house. We're a farmhouse. You know what I found out? We're city people. <laughs> and she likes to stay up late and for me to say, Get out of bed. Let's just get real about this thing. If you ladies have a late night, you ain't having an early morning. Now, men, we can have late, late nights and go Baptist night clubbing, and we're up and, and just like, yeah, let's get it done. I don't know where that came from. You say, what's Baptist night clubbing? It's IHOP. Amen. <laughs> but you're special, ladies, and God never meant for your gender to cross over into a man's gender and for you to lose your ladyhood for the sake of dressing in a certain way. Unfortunately and sadly, this one verse has caused more controversy in the average independent Baptist church than any other verse. 
The controversy has been created, though, because of how it's been approached. The preacher should have stepped out with the shepherd's staff and the heart of God rather than stepping out with a bully pulpit beating ladies into conformity. Amen. Let me make a statement. It's easier for a man to live for Christ in 2017 than it is for a lady to live for Christ on this subject. Our society is geared toward men. Our society is geared toward dressing like a man. Our society is more acceptable to look like a man than it is to look like a lady. One of the reasons I wanted to preach this to our church is I don't want anybody who's a member of the Longview Baptist Temple to ever be confused about where their pastor stands on this subject. I don't want the young people growing up to think that pastor believes differently than the Bible. Now, before we get started, let me tell you this, men, when you start judging ladies for not dressing according to Deuteronomy 22.5, before you do that, could you go a year without your pornography and then you can say something about men, about them. If you can go a year without any anger, then you can step up to the pulpit and you can judge somebody else. It is easy to judge a lady's journey more than simply put the truth out there and let the verse judge the journey. You see, at the end of the day, you go home with God. You don't go home with me. At the end of the day, your night is spent with the Holy Ghost on the inside, regurgitating and churning the verses that you said. And if I have angered somebody, then they churn in my voice rather than churning in the voice of the Holy Ghost of God that's on the inside. However, it doesn't mean that my words can be compromising. I must be firm on what the Bible says because that's what the Bible says. And whether we like it or not, gentlemen, listen to us. It is easier for us to live for God in the area of dress than it is for a lady. Nobody looks at us weird when we walk out with a pair of pants. But I promise you, the ladies, every day they live, if they're going to obey Deuteronomy 22.5, they catch it on a lot of levels. I do think this. That to be crude about ladies wearing pants is ill-mannered and in bad taste. But how many times we've been sitting in a service where somebody decided they would get up and make fun of ladies who wear pants and we're sitting there going, man, I got an aunt, I, 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 I got a sister, I got cousins that they know they would be so turned off to my Christ That's right. by preachers not acting Christ-like. Yes. Yes. Now, I'm unashamed of my stand. But again, I think firmness and kindness go hand in hand Amen. to where I don't even bat an eye on the subject. And if you don't agree with me on the subject, then I have, that's not my problem. Because I didn't write the book. I'm just the mail guy who shows up and I deliver the mail. And then you got to deal with it when you open it up. But it is in the book. And I don't think you're here for anything other than Tell me what the book says. I don't think you want Bob's opinion. I, want, I think you want God's opinion. And could I say for my preacher brethren, uh, let's never weaken our stand on Deuteronomy 22.5 for the sake of keeping somebody in the church. Let, let's never weaken our stand on Deuteronomy 22.5 for being accepted by the liberal brethren. We have brethren that claim to be independent fundamental Baptists that are weakening their stand on Deuteronomy 22.5 and they truly believe that how a lady dresses is of no consequence to getting the gospel out. Listen to this. It is of no consequence to getting the gospel out, but you are creating a second generation who won't get the gospel out because once you violate your stand on how a lady should dress, then the stand on entertainment and the stand on association and the stand on everything else it's a slippery slope let me show you for brother John if you'll stand right there brother John and I if and here's what's happening when you look at ministries and you look at preachers and by the way wouldn't we love to think that our local churches are only influenced by our local pastor but that is not the case in this day and time and I have no idea, y'all, why I'm even preaching this in Columbus, Ohio on a Wednesday morning other than God said to do it. And so I don't know what else to do but do it. 
But there are outside voices that you can plug into in your phone and on broadcast and on publications that are weakening their living standard, but yet you're confused because they are like doctrinally, they're up here. So how, what, what, what is going on? Here's the difference. We may doctrinally believe the same way and on the timeline, but can I tell you something? Behavioral, face that way, behave, step up next to me, behavioral wise, we are going different directions. So when you compare our doctrine, we are on the same direction. But when you compare our behavior, we are headed different ways. Now listen to me. If you carry that doctrine to the next generation, go, go, go. If you carry that doctrine or that behavior, stop right there, to the next generation, Brother John, face the choir loft. Are you ready? Then guess what? Now our doctrine has changed in the next generation because here's why. Come back. You can't doctrinally believe this book without behaving the same way. But when you pepper out with the shotgun and take white out and white out those verses and explain them away and change God's narrative on what is about to be addressed, then listen, what I'm about to tell you, now you've changed the behavior and we may start seeing a little bit of a difference now and a little bit of a difference, but check out the kids of the people who preach and compromise and what you're going to find out is, and I understand all kids have a, a tough time, but what you're going to find out is now they doctrinally are standing on a different plane. And where I keep the King James, they have to change to the ESV, Brother Rob, because that book matches their behavior. Yeah, have a seat. So because of that, so I'm going to put my soapbox away. Let me give you two verses, if I could. Two verses that become the bookends. And that's how I'm going to articulate this. And I'll be done in 20 minutes, if that's okay. These two verses are the bookends for how a woman should dress and how she should act in how she dresses. I want you to write down, let's go to two, Deuteronomy 22, 5. You're already there. The woman shall not wear that which pertains unto a man. Go to 1 Timothy 2, 9 now. These are the two bookend verses. So if I were to shelve a lady's dress, then whatever is said is to be said with these two verses in the context. And ladies, you may have already embraced this. And ladies, you've, you may have already believed this. You have just may have never known how to articulate it. And I think it's the preacher's job in America to articulate it in such a way that you walk out with this beautiful picture that says, I got it. Now I know how to carry it to the next generation. If you'll look there, and by the way, we're going to flip back and forth to these two. 1 Timothy 2, 9, in like manner also. That's a whole, whole nother deal. He's talking about prayer at the top part. And I preached a sermon on what immodest dress does to a church back at our place last year, two years ago. And I explained the top part. But this little phrase, in like manner also, we won't deal with that this morning, that women adorn themselves in what? Modest apparel. Please go back to Deuteronomy 22 5, the very first book in on our bookshelf, if you don't mind, that we're going to put every discussion between the two. We're going to filter everything through these two verses. I want you to write out next to Deuteronomy 22 5, first of all, 1 Timothy 2 9. So let's create a road map in your Bible so that you know next time you come to this part in your study Bible, hey, I need to be reminded of 1 Timothy 2 9. And then I want you to write down this word distinction. Distinction. What are the two bookends that we're going to operate everything on ladies' dress between? And by the way, I know you're going to be shocked at this. I've never been a lady. <laughs> I know this is really going to be a comfort to you. I don't be plan on becoming a lady. I know you're happy. My wife's happy about that one. Because I'm not going to be Barbara Gray. I think I'll stay Bob Gray. But, but, but uh, honestly... I don't have to know women's fashion and I don't have to understand it because God already said what he thought about it. And Deuteronomy 22, 5 is about distinction. Now go back to 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 9. And right out beside that, modesty. So the primary teaching is the two bookends are this, distinction in address, the way a lady should dress, and then modesty in the distinction. Now, now, write down those two words and look right up here, if you don't mind, and understand this. And, and, and please get this, then I'm going to be very quick on the two verses, and I could go for hours on this subject. 
We live in a day and time where preachers are saying modesty is more important than distinction. Have you all heard that? It's pretty sad. But let me tell you something. Absolutely not. Distinction is more important than modesty. And if you have to compromise your distinction in order to be modest, then you've just violated God's word. You say, how can you say, Brother Bob, that distinction is primary, modesty is secondary? Because I want you to notice in one, those, both of those verses, which one says it makes God sick? The modesty or the distinction? It's not the modesty. It's the distinction. And when God said, when a woman puts on a man's apparel, if you will settle the distinction question, then you'll have no problem with the modesty question. And every time I've seen a lady say, I'm making up my mind on this day. By the way, it has to be the lady's decision. And when a lady finally comes to grips with, I am going to be distinct in my dress, then she can be modest in her distinction. But as long as, well, modesty is the primary deal, you know, and it'd be better for me to wear a pair of pants and be modest than it would for me to wear a skirt and be immodest. Listen to me, that's the devil's ploy to get you out of the Old Testament of God's mind and get you into the New Testament of grace. You can't live in grace until you first address the law. What was God's mind behind the law? And God said, I want a distinction. I want a separation in dress. And then, ladies, once you're separate in that dress, then you start behaving modestly inside the decision you've already made. And I'm just going to put it out here, and, and there is no sarcasm in my heart, but I believe that we're doing our ladies such a disservice. You, you are so valuable that we have reduced our ladies to a humanistic mindset that is a logical rather than spiritual. Logically, that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Be modest. So in order to be modest, you're going to have to kind of compromise your distinction. And you know what God's saying? Please don't do that. So the two words are distinction and modesty. Next page. Go to Deuteronomy 22.5. Let me explain these two, and then I'm going to give you some closing thoughts, and I'm done. I'm going to be done quicker than what I thought. Deuteronomy 22.5, because it's very simple. Hey, don't you love when a preacher says that? It's fixing to get long. Uh, the woman, are you there? The woman shall not wear that, and this phrase is the key, which pertaineth unto a man. Now, notice here that it creates a comma, and it says, which pertaineth unto a man. So you're going to find out, pertaineth unto a man's what? Yeah. Yeah. Why does God say to a lady, don't put on a man's apparel because it pertains to what? It pertains to three things. And if you'll write these down and, uh, and let me give you the, I'll give you the three things in just a second. So we're not to put on that which pertains. So let me give you the proper way to look at this. And then I'll get to that phrase. A little bit, got a little bit ahead of myself. Uh, bad Bob. So here we go. You ready? The proper way to look at this verse is first of all, are you ready? The Lord's feelings on the verse. So the right way to look at this verse first is from the glasses of not what do I wear, but how does God feel about what I wear? Now, ladies, listen to me, and I'm, I'm, I'm trying to lead softly here, but you truly are going to have to take into account not what does your husband think, and not what does your pastor think. And not does what some other lady think in the church. You're going to have to put on the Lord's glasses and say, how does my Lord feel? I get a call one day. I was a rookie youth pastor and it was a 17-year-old young lady. I'm probably 22 now, married. Deanna's just a couple months old. Back before cell phones, pagers, or anything like that, the landline rings at the house and... Young lady's on the other end, and she says, Brother Bob, 17, has her own car, works her own job. And the young lady says, uh, I've gotten myself into a pickle, and I need to tell my dad that I have just crossed some lines, and now I'm going to 
no, I'm going to pay for it. Whatever you're thinking right now, you're exactly right. That was the subject. That was the awfulness of it. I say, explain to me what happened. How did you get yourself in, in this spot to this end of... She told me the story, and it was like, okay. I called her dad at work, and I said, uh, hey, you know, can we meet at the church? Um, your daughter called me. We need to meet. Y'all, that's back before you could send a text to find out what was going on. Right now, it's instant what's going on. Back then, it was truly you had to wait to find out any news. And so I showed up at the church, told Kelly what was going on. I showed up at the church. 17-year-old girl comes pulling up in her car. Empty parking lot. Back before Longview grew, it was a desolate part of our city. And she's bawling. And I said, I, you want me to tell your dad? And he, she said, no, I'll tell him. Dad come pulling in his pickup truck and good old East Texas redneck guy. Pulls up and you know how dads are. You bothered me. What are we doing? Hangs his arm out the truck and, and says, all right, what'd she do this time? And I said, well, dad, it's a little bit more complicated than that. When he saw the seriousness in my, my rookie high-pitched voice back then, uh, he shut his truck off, got out, leaned up against the truck. And, 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 and the daughter began to tell this story of how she got herself into the situation and in nine months what was about to happen. Y'all, I literally saw a grown man get angry at first and then the red face turned to such a pale face that he went to the back of the pickup truck and he started just throwing up. And I watched him vomit everything he had eaten in the last year it seemed like. He wiped the vomit from his face and came back and he said this was not the picture I had in my head when I held you as a little girl this is not what I thought about that's what the word abomination means here you see we preach it forever that God's mad at you when you put on a pair of pants but I'm telling you when he made man and female and every time a lady crosses that line, God just goes, that's not what I had in mind. The very first feelings to take into consideration is the Lord. You see, your husband didn't make you. I didn't make you. The doctor didn't make you. Your God gave you your gender. And your God wanted your gender to be something prized and something special. And that's why he said, Let's be distinct in our clothing. The primary apparel for a man is pants, and the primary apparel for a lady is a skirt or a dress. The woman is addressed first in this verse, and the man is addressed second. The purpose for the separation of how the genders dress was to keep the genders from crossing lines in roles and responsibilities. When you were made a lady and you were made a man, automatically God set your agenda and your to-do list in life. And with that agenda and with that to-do list, to -do list, like every occupation, there comes a uniform. Football players have a uniform that you don't wear on a basketball court. Basketball players have a uniform that you don't wear on a football field. Chick-fil-A people have a uniform that you can't wear at IHOP. IHOP people have a uniform that they won't let you wear at Panera Bread. And God said, I'll give you an occupation. Did you hear that? I'm going to give you an occupation in life, and with that occupation comes a uniform. And men, I'm going to give you an occupation in life, and with that occupation comes a uniform. And when you try to go to somebody else's job site to do their job, then you're going to have to wear their yep. uniform. And that's why God said, I'm going to so separate the genders that I'm giving both of you your own occupation and I'm going to give you your own uniform so that nobody will ever ask you to do a job that your uniform will not let you do. Do you know, I think men, could I just be honest? We have put our women in the position 
how they dress in this day and time because we've not valued them as ladies. I think we take the first part, help me, to mean get out here and labor with me. Mm. I've got to hurry. Let's, let's, and I don't know if you're interested, but I'm going to give you the rest of it. <laughs> it is most likely, it is more likely for a woman to put on a man's apparel than it is for a man to put on a woman's apparel. Most men do not want to do the woman's work. However, we can do most, if not all, of the woman's work without dressing like a woman. I can do the dishes. Monday night, I was telling Brother Rob, uh, Monday night, uh, Kelly's been ill, RG's been ill, Jordan caught it, and so I didn't want to leave them with a house of work, so I made up my mind Monday when I came home uh, that I was going to get on it, get all the every bit of laundry done in the house, fold it, put away. Uh, all the dishes were done, put away. I was going to get out the vacuum cleaner. I was going to make up my mind that these two days, Kelly was not going to have to do any housework. So I started washing clothes and, and ironing and, and, and folding. And, and, and by the way, I hate, hate, hate that kind of work. But to some degree, I do enjoy it. So I was, Dan sent me a link, and so I'm sitting there folding clothes, watching you two guys preach, and it was like, if they only knew what I was doing right now. <laughs> I almost took a selfie of myself and sent it to you. But can I tell you something? When I was doing that, I didn't have to go put on a, a woman's skirt to do a woman's job. Reverse it this way. Most ladies dress like a man when there's no cause for it because you're never doing a man's work. Like, for instance, you can mow a lawn and not dress like a man. You can literally hammer a nail for a picture and not have to go dress like a man. But our society has conditioned us to be comfortable rather than to be biblical. Yeah, that's right. All right. And so we have lost our lady likeness. And so when you dress like a man, then what is the difference between you nailing a picture in a house and you toting a bale of hay or doing a man's work? Pertains unto a man. There are three words that would govern this. One is the word provide, for which pertains to a man. The next word is the word protect. And then the next word is the word propagate. So there are three words that govern how a man's dressed. So when the Bible says, a woman shall not wear that which pertaineth unto, when you study that in the Hebrew idiom, it literally means don't put on a man's garment to where you are the protector, you are the provider, and you are the propagator. You are to put on a garment that is in keeping with your role. Now, we won't go into it, but we are going to go to Genesis. So if you'll start making your way back. When before man and woman sinned, they were naked. There were no need for clothes. And there, because it was a perfect environment, uh, there was no need for the distinction in dress. Once man sinned, there was a distinction, listen to this, in how they viewed each other. And God knew if I don't cover up the woman and cover up the man, it's going to be such a distraction because of the sin nature that we are going to get ourselves in trouble. Have you ever heard a preacher say, acting like a barnyard animal? You want to know why? Because animals don't wear clothes. And I'm not going any further, but animals have animal instincts because God knew that once sin entered into your life and my life, we needed a tent. We needed a covering to keep our, those depraved instincts from getting out of hand. So God knew we didn't need to be distracted, that he knew that we needed to be set apart and to get this thing done. So because of that, the man, God said, you dress this way because your occupation is going to be to protect. Your occupation is going to be to provide. And your occupation is going to be to, to propagate. Ladies, on this side, your occupation now comes in just two forms. You are to be a wife and you are to be a mother. You are to occupy yourself with the desire towards your husband and to make sure you have children. Now, ladies, unfortunately, uh, God said after the sin that you would have sorrow in conception and sorrow in birthing. And I don't understand that. If we were having babies, don't give me an epidural. We don't need one of those things. Let's just have the men could have babies without any pain medicine whatsoever. 
And until you can prove me wrong, I'm just going to stick to that story. But that's what ladies are supposed to do. Watch this, ladies. Whenever the men get out of a lady's life, then guess what they now have to do? They now have to step over here, and they now have to protect and provide. The reason I wear pants is because it is easier for me to provide for my family because I'm always moving. I'm always stretching. In World War II, when the ladies went to the shops because the men all went to war to fight, uh, to fight the, the, what was going on in the European market, then the ladies could not do that job in a dress for safety reasons. So they put on a man's apparel to do a man's activity. That's why, to some degree, our ladies should not be joining the military because joining the military means that you now are doing the occupation of a man. You say, how do I know if it's the occupation of a man? If you have to dress like one to do the occupation, then that's the occupation of a man. One of our young ladies says, I want to become a nurse. And I said, great. How far up the ladder do you want to go? She looked at me like I was crazy because she said, well, I can only go far up. As a, I, I can't go far in the industry. I was like, why? She said, because, Pastor, they won't let you in a surgical unit without wearing scrubs. <laughs> Y'all, when you look at everything through the eyes of distinction, that this is my occupation, and I am not going to do an occupation that makes me change my distinction, then you've already set boundaries where to say no at. Yeah. And this is not even rocket science, y'all. You say, well, that means, that means if I live up north, uh, all, all my activities in the snow are... If you have to change your distinction to enjoy an activity or do an occupation, my friend, then don't do the activity and don't, in, don't do the occupation. Just a second. Amen, Brother Bob. That's good preaching right there. Yes, sir. Amen. Amen. Woo-hoo. All right. So when God created man, it was for the purpose of providing protecting and propagating when God created woman it was for the for the for the for the um, purpose of loving a husband and loving children and God said when you're doing that then here's how I want you to dress because this is your occupation do, do you know there was a time when you went and took an aptitude test to find out if you could do the occupation and, and I don't, how many have ever taken one of those workforce after? You ever taken one? You know, I don't know what it was like when you took yours, but they put this stupid game in front of you with these shapes. Do they do that to you? And you got this timer. It was a little kid's game. And I could not believe they put this little kid's game out in front of me, and they depressed this thing, set the timer, said, put all the shapes together. Y'all, I, I was in my 20s going, um, 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 can you stop the timer because... Uh, uh, okay, um, um, and so I went through like five aptitude tests, and when I got all the way done, the lady looked at me and said, Sir, you are only suited for these occupations. You, you know what they were? Teacher, preacher, <laughs> philosopher, sales agent. And I said, So, like, I shouldn't go into manufacturing? And they went, no. Have you ever seen that I Love Lucy show where they're trying to, and she starts eating all the things. And I was like, yeah. She goes, that's what you would be. You would so frustrate somebody. Let me tell you, when God made you ladies, he was like, I'm going to give you the best job ever. Think about this. I don't want you to get dirty. I don't want you the pressure of having to make the money. And I don't want you out there fighting. I want you protected back here behind a man and keep your elegance and keep your queenship and, and keep your value and be pristine and be something we can put on our arms and you're the ultimate lady 100% of the time. Don't demean yourself by ever taking an occupation that makes you change your distinction. And don't ever demean yourself by doing an activity that you would have to demean your distinction. Amen. If any occupation, any activity makes you have to put on a man's pair of pants, then God goes. Well, my husband's okay with it, but your husband's not your creator. Well, the church I attend, they, they kind of give a free pass on certain activity, but your pastor's not your creator. Let's go to the second word, and I'm done in five minutes. I think this one will say, say, say itself. 2 Timothy 2, 1 Timothy 2.9. Not only have we discussed the distinction because of the occupation, 
And that if you have to change your distinction, now you know why distinction is primary, modesty is secondary. Because once you now make up your mind, ladies, I am no longer going to put on a man's pants, a man's pair of shorts, a pajamas at night. I'm going to be 100%. Oh, did I say the word pajamas? I should not have said bad, Bob. Uh, well, I am not going to put on anything that is a man's apparel. And I'm going to come to this side. And I'm not going to let anybody move me off of how God made me and my gender now you have to operate in this word called modesty inside your decision. So you cannot claim modesty until you have come to grips with distinction. Let's just be honest. So let's look at it. Are you ready? Several amazing things about this verse. In like manner also that women adorn themselves in what kind of apparel? Modest apparel. The word modest is a very interesting word. I don't know if you know this or not, but our New Testament was translated from the Greek. Um, so people who say don't ever use the Greek, I, I think they're shortening their, their insight on the Word of God. Um, and I will tell you this, when I went back to the Greek uh, lexicon and uh, in my study things, I was like, okay, okay, what is the Greek word for that, number one? So I found the Greek word for that, and the Greek word for the word modesty, is, is, it simply means what it, what it says. You, you have to be modest. Are you ready for the only other time that Greek word is ever used in the Bible? This was amazing. Are you ready? Greek word translated modest. It's only used one other time in the Bible. Are you ready? Go to 1 Timothy 3, 2. 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 2. The word modest is very simple. No showing of flesh. In other words, they're, they're, you just don't show flesh. So if you're modest ladies, can I tell you that if somebody looks at you, they first pick up on your apparel and not your flesh. So then, look at this. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good. Here's the only other English word translated from that Greek word. What is the word? Behavior. So, ladies, inside your modesty, if you make up the decision, I am not putting on a man's gar garment because that is not my occupation, that is not my job. Can I tell you, I'm living up, we're living up, we're, I'm up north right now, so you'll understand this. Union, union, create a union for your job. That, that, that's not my job. In fact, ladies, refuse to do anything that is not in keeping with your occupation. And put the men back where they need to go. Y'all remember that Mr. Mom crazed where everybody, all the men stayed home, the women went out and got a job? Stupidest thing i ever heard in my life. So the word modest here is the word behavior. Ladies, listen to me. It is no longer good enough for us to think in terms, well, while I'm, while I'm standing, it, I'm, I'm, I'm modest. And, 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 and while I'm sitting, I'm modest. The word is behavior. So inside your dress, if your behavior causes you to be immodest, then you're to double-check your apparel or you're to double-check your activity. I praise God I was raised around ladies that not only made the distinction, but they also made up their mind, I'm going to if, if my behavior and how I'm dressed causes me to be immodest, then I will not do that. But you know what people are doing now? Well, if you're going to be immodest in doing it, just change the clothes for the sake of doing the activity. God said this. No, no, no. The two bookends. I want not only there to be a distinction in how you dress, but inside of dressing godly and like I made you, make sure you behave in such a way that you never do anything that would make you immodest. And people right now are trying to change God's narrative on this subject. And they're trying to say, well, the more important thing is modesty. No, no, no. Distinction, modesty. And if you can't be modest, and that's why I, 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 I just fear for our ladies because they're going to be just put in a position they shouldn't be put in. Right. Climb that ladder. Tote that bail. Well, you know, I'm not dressed for it. Then go change your dress and let's get the work done. Oh, guys, I'd much rather work three and four jobs to keep my wife from violating the, 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 her Amen. God's feeling about her and keeping her so modest. Amen. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Oh, let me tell you something. I never understood as a little boy. But every time my mama would bend down to pick up something, the first thing she would do was grab her top. Yeah. 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 
For years, Brother Rob, I thought she was having a heart attack. <laughs> no, seriously, I thought my mama's got heart problems. And now as a married man, I get it. And you know what I find my wife doing now? But how many women do we know? Or they try to be fashionable in their dress, but, but, but they better not get into a fire because, oh, ladies, if your behavior in apparel makes you immodest, and it doesn't matter what the behavior is, if sitting down makes you immodest, if crossing your leg makes you immodest, if getting in and out of a car makes you immodest, if anything to where you now have to be on guard every time that you're looking around. Uh, ladies, can I just tell you that the book ends here, everything's got to be that way. Modest apparel. I lied. I'm two minutes over. Apparel simply means this, costume. It means costume. All of your apparel should be so modest that there is a mystery about who you really are. I was preaching a Mardi Gras Fat Tuesday down in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, preaching a Mardi Gras conference. And these people come walking out of this hotel, and they were all costumed up. You all know anything about Mardi Gras? They're all costumed up. And three of them coming at me with these big old feathers, and they're having the duck everywhere and just mask. And, and, and I walked up to I'm curious. You, do, you put something that freaky in front of me, I'm going to ask you. You ain't getting away without me asking. If you dress that way, I figure you want me to ask you about it. So I walked up, and I said, what are you all doing I thought was a woman, this voice came, we're going to Mardi Gras. And I was like, whoa. <laughs> Can I tell you, what you wear and how you behave in what you wear should keep still the mystery in who you are. And if your behavior and what you wear, there's no mystery anymore. Could I just be honest? Then you're igniting the lust of men around you. Men, could you help me right now? How many men right now would stand in testimony of this? I'm the first one standing. That you have been in church someplace that a lady was not dressed according to what I just said and it ignited a thought in your head that you should have never had. Would you stand to your feet? If that's you, would you stand? You can have a seat. Will you help us, ladies? Will you help us? I don't know why I'm preaching this other than to say this. Don't you think because they're 13 that they don't have in them the ability to be depraved? Yes, Closing statements and I'm done. The distinction in dress is to keep the roles separate. The modesty in dress is to keep the flesh from igniting the lust of men. Modesty is secondary, distinction is primary. If at any level, ladies, please listen to this. If, at any, if a lady at any level must put on a man's garment to stay modest, then we have the two verses reversed. If the activity requires any ladies to lose her distinction at any level for the sake of being modest, then you change the activity. And if you'll operate by God's word, I promise you, you will come out with such a reverence. I preached a Sunday night on my way out the door, shaking hands. A lady stopped me and said, Pastor, can I tell you my testimony? I said, sure. She said, somebody said, try it for seven days, dressing completely like a lady, and see how you're treated. She said, so I did. I laid out my outfits for seven days, and they were all dresses. At the end of the seven days, I had more doors open for me. I had more boxes carried for me. I had more people saying, boy, your husband's a very blessed man. I had more people saying, wow, you, you, you shouldn't be doing that. Oh, my soul, here, have a seat. Oh, my soul, let's get in out of the... And she said, it's so I saw it then. People started, and I'll end with this, people started treating me how God had always viewed yes. me. Thank you very much. Very good. Very good.